Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for once again blessing us, Lord, to be here at this holy convocation, Lord, at this camp meeting. And Lord, we know that you desire to pour out your rain upon us, Lord. And therefore, we ask once again, even in this presentation, Lord, we ask for the rain. We ask for more light, Lord. Lord, we, we need this. Lord, we need to ripen, Lord, fully. Lord, because uh, the reapers, they cannot take in any fruit, Lord, that is not fully ripe. So, dear God, we ask for the rain. We ask that you bless Brother Theodore, bless his mind, Lord, to convey the things you have taught him to your people. Lord, we thank you and we ask for the rain in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good afternoon. And originally, I had prepared these notes that are in your book uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, as it says in the introduction, this is a short study of the final week of the 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9. Well, the study is not as short as these notes now because they've given me two more spots because there is, as we've been passing over the ground, and we're going to talk about that, God has been giving light to his people on the prophecies on what's coming before us. But still today, I'm going to be following uh, before lunch uh, half of these notes and after lunch the, the other half and then you will have tomorrow you'll have a new set of notes which will be two presentations. Now this study came from a result of studying uh, the letters of Samuel Sm Snow. So many of you know of the prophetic mirror. How many people don't know about the prophetic mirror of Samuel Snow's letters? How many people don't? Have never studied it? So there's a few. So that means many of you have studied Samuel Snow's letters. And when we look at one of the misunderstandings of William Miller, he had this prophecy of the 490 years or 70 weeks ending in 33 AD. And we're going to look at that. So this model here where we have the cross in 31 AD was not the model of Miller's. Miller had the 70 weeks, the 49 years here, it's probably too small. Let's make it 49. And he had the seven years here and he had this as 33 AD and he had this as the cross and I'm gonna read this now this is something I just recently found out uh, about a month and a half maybe two months ago I had always assumed that Miller had started the 70 weeks on the first day of the first month in 457 when Ezra left Babylon and I've taught that many, many times. But as I was studying this out uh, in July, I noticed that Miller had the 70 weeks start on the 12th day of the first month when Ezra left the river Ahava. And so I was doing a presentation on uh, the two prophetic mirrors in 457, one that points to Pentecost and one that points to the Day of Atonement. How many people are not familiar with the two prophetic mirrors in, in the story of Ezra going from Babylon to Jerusalem. How many people are not familiar? So there's a few people not familiar with those mirrors and I'm not going to do a study on them. But I was doing a study on that and this uh, statement here is taken from Miller, William Miller's works, volume 2, page 53. And he says, the Bible chronology says that Ezra started to go up to Jerusalem on the 12th day of the first month. And he says, see Ezra 8.31. 457 years before the birth of Christ. So Miller believed that Jesus was born sort of like in zero year. I'm not really sure you know, where he had exactly. Maybe at the end of 1 B.C. It's not clear where exactly he placed Christ's birth. Um, so he being 33 when he died, added to 457, will make 490 years. Three of the evangelists tell us that he was betrayed two days before the feast of the Passover. 
and of course was the same day crucified. So how many people have ever heard the idea that Jesus was crucified not on Passover, the 14th day, but on the 12th day of the first month? How many people have ever heard that? So there's a few people who have heard that. That's what Miller taught, at least at this time uh, when he was teaching, when he wrote this. It's the only place I could find that he said this, uh, though he does hint at it in other places. Um, so it says, three of the evangelists tell us that he was betrayed two days before the feast of the Passover and of course the same day crucified. The Passover was always kept on the 14th day of the first month forever and Christ being crucified two days before would make it on the 12th day, 490 years from the time Ezra left the river Ahava to go unto Jerusalem. So you'll find other places where Miller says that Jesus died exactly 490 years to the day from when they left Babylon. And I'd always wondered about that, and now I found the quote that says that. The problem with this, as we can see, is that it's not taking into account that there's no zero year between 1 BC and 1 AD. And so, if you counted from 457 on the 12th day of the first month to 33 AD on the 12th day of the first month, you would have 389 years. You wouldn't have 490. Now he's referencing uh, two verses. I couldn't find the third that he talks about. Uh, there's Matthew 26, 2 and Mark 14, verse 1. Matthew 26, 2 says, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And Mark 14, verse 1 says, After two days was the feast of the Passover, and of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft to put him to death. So, neither of the, one of these says that Jesus was crucified on the twelfth day, or to, crucified two days before Passover. So it's a little bit unreasonable when you look at all the other scriptures to place the crucifixion of Christ on the twelfth day of the first month. Now, Snow's understanding that developed uh, in 1844. So Snow came to understand that Jesus Christ was crucified in the midst of the week, which I'm going to do over there. And it was in 31 AD. Now he's uncertain, I'm not, or at least I'm not certain about exactly how he came to understand this, other than that he used two sources. One is called the Death warrant of Jesus Christ, which is a fake document that was published in the newspapers of the day, sort of like Facebook back in the 18, 1844. And uh, they would have lots of memes and little stories that would be passed around from paper to paper that were not true, but they helped sell papers. And he picked up on one of these called the death warrant of Jesus Christ. And this has lots of problems with it, and I'm not going to go over that. I do a paper on that. But he places the crucifixion in 31 AD. And he, and, and I could spend time going through a lot of how he developed this, but the most important thing is that when he was teaching this, the first time he presents it, is in an article that's in May 2nd, in 34 AD, and May 2nd and 34 AD is Passover. So he has this article in the Midnight Cry that's published on May 2nd. And he's dealing with the Passover and he's presenting this chiasm. And this is the center of a chiasm of his letters. So for those that don't know about the chiasm of Samuel Snow's letters, it's important because he's discussing in this article the Passover that it's in 31 AD, and that it's a chiasm of three and a half years on either side. And there's, there's much that we, we've learned from this by studying Samuel Snow's letters, but the thing that I'm bringing this out for is that I was interested in studying about the midst of the week. Now, all of you have experienced um, discussions with people about the 2520, and one of the arguments you may bring up is that this model here with the three and a half years is a 2520, right? So 
I need one of these. And so we know that three and a half years is 42 months. And 42 months, 30 days to a month, is 1,260 days. And we can see then that this is a 2520 if you add these two together. Now this is on the 1863 chart. It's the first time it's represented on a chart. Um, in the top right corner, below the, uh, the 2300 day prophecy and the 70 week prophecy, and they have this week laid out more like this with the cross and the three and a half on either side. So the PowerPoint of 1863, that's, that's the best they did with that. But it was hidden there, I believe, at the end of 2,604 years of the prophetic mirror. So I'm not going to do that right now. So there's also a study on the prophetic mirror. Uh, but the main point is I was wanting to study this. So what we're going to look at is the, the verse that deals with this. And this is Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. And we're going to look at a little bit more detail about what this says. And we're going to lay this out on a line. Now it says, And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come, so that would be Titus, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So this verse, if you look on page 42 of your notes, can div be divided as A1 and B1. That is, it's introducing this idea of Christ being crucified, um, cut off, and it also introduces the idea of the destruction of Jerusalem. And these two things are put together for a reason, I believe, probably a number of reasons, but uh, one of the things, of course, is that the result of rejecting the Messiah is going to lead to the destruction of Jerusalem, but also the temple, as we see in the next part. Um, so the next verse says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So this is dealing with the sanctuary service. And then we have this rather cryptic uh, Hebrew, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Um, so, in, uh, in the, the notes that I have here, it talks about this. Now this is, um, so we can see again it's divided as uh, B2, or, or pardon me, so it's A1 and B1 and A2 and B2, so we're divided. So the second part of each of those verses is dealing with the temple and the city, and the first part of each of those verses is dealing with the crucifixion of Christ in the middle of the week. Now it says uh, on page 43, there's a note from uh, Adam Clark's commentary, and, he's, and it says, For the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. This clause is remarkably obscure. And he has how it's pronounced in Hebrew, which doesn't matter. And upon the wing of abominations causing amazement. But that's what it literally is translated as. And so you will find, as he says, some later manuscripts that show that this is about the profanation of the temple. It's about the temple itself. And it's, it's um, about its abomination. And so he refers us to uh, the words of Christ in Matthew 24, 15 that shows that this is how this verse should be understood. Now I think it's probably a Hebrew idiom that means that, that is kind of we've lost over time. But it's important to note that the destruction of Solomon's temple um, is connected here with this verse. Now. There's an interesting point that many of us do not know, but there's probably some here who do. Um, and this is about when the temple was destroyed. 
So Solomon's first temple, on your notes, page 44, in Jeremiah 52, verse 12, it says, Now in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which is the nineteenth year of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon, into Jerusalem, and burned the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great man burned he with fire. Now, this says that the, the temple was burned on the tenth day of the fifth month. So the fifth month on the Jewish calendar is called Av, so it's the tenth of Av. And um, there is another verse in Kings that says it was on the seventh day of the fifth month. But it's actually, there's a solution to that, and that is that it has a, it's actually not exactly the same. The other one says, unto Jerusalem. And so it's understood that he came unto Jerusalem on the seventh day of the fifth month, and then it took him time to go into the city and finally destroy the temple. And that's how it's understood uh, by the rabbis and many other people. Now, when we look at the second temple, or what we call Herod's temple, according to Josephus, this is the same date that the te second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And I have the count here of Josephus. It says, So Titus retired into the Tower of Antonia and resolved to storm the temple the next day, early in the morning, with his whole army, and to encamp around about the holy house. But as for that house, God had for certain long ago doomed it to the fire. And now that fatal day was come, according to the revolution of ages. It was the tenth day of the month, Av, or Los, upon which was formerly, it was formerly burnt by the king of Babylon. So there's, it's a very interesting detail. And we're going to see why it's significant to note this. Now one of the things that we're doing here, and just sort of to prepare you a little bit, is we're going to be dealing with some dates and we're going to be dealing with some calendars. And I'm going to try to simplify things a little bit as we go through them. Uh, but some things I can't completely simplify. You're going to have to at least try to memorize some of these dates. And I would take note of this date, try to take notes of some of these significant dates as we go through this. Now Ellen White talks about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And uh, I have this here from the Great Controversy, page 34, or 32 to 34. I'm going to read a little bit of it. Uh, it's the stuff that's highlighted. She says, uh, Josephus himself, in a most eloquent appeal, entreated them to surrender, to save themselves, their city, and their place of worship. But his words were answered with bitter curses. Darts were hurled at him, their last human mediator, as he stood pleading with them. And so you can see here in this picture that's described, and it's, it's a very good account to read how Ellen White writes it, and she does quote from others um, as well. She quotes from Milman, The History of the Jews. Um, but it's quite a dramatic scene, this destruction of the temple. And of course we know that there's great significance in it. Uh, she says in the next paragraph, the blind obstinacy of the Jewish leaders and the detestable crimes perpetrated within the besieged city excited the horror and indignation of the Romans. And Titus at last decided to take the temple by storm. He determined, however, that if possible it should be saved from destruction. But his commands were disregarded. After he had retired to his tent at night, the Jews, sallying forth from the temple, attacked the soldiers without. In the struggle, a firebrand was flung by a soldier through an opening in the porch, and immediately the cedar-lined chambers about the house were in a blaze. And there's just so many things about this account, and I think you should read it uh, from the great controversy. So we're going to come back to the destruction of Jerusalem. It's an important point. Uh, but what we're going to do right now is we're just going to look at this prophetic mirror in its simplest form, just like we had here. 
but we're going to notice some things. So of course it has a start and an end. So what end date would you place for the stoning of Stephen when the Jewish probation has closed in 34 AD? What date would you place on the Jewish calendar for that event? Okay, well, autumn, right? <laughs> it's autumn. Okay, we know that. Um, when does the 70 weeks begin? What date does it begin? Okay, somebody says the Day of Atonement. Now, how would we know that? Well, the Great Controversy doesn't really tell us that it's the Day of Atonement. We get it that it's in the fall. But we have a prophetic mirror in Ezra 7 to 10. And in that prophetic mirror, we find that the Day of Atonement lies between the first day of the first month, when Ezra arrives at Jerusalem, and the 20th day of the ninth month when he completes his task of setting up the civil administration and calls people to repentance. So if you go from the first day of the fifth month to the 20th day of the ninth month, it's 140 days and in the center of that, 70 days. And we know there's 70 days from the first day of the first month. Symbolically, there's literally 68 or 69. And then there's... Um, to the 10th day of the 7th month, there's 70 days, because we know there's 120 from the first day of the first month to the first, or first day of the first month to the first day of the 5th month, and then there's 70 from the first day of the 5th month to the 10th day of the 7th month. But there's also 70 from the 10th day of the 7th month to the 20th day of the 9th month. So I probably could draw this just, uh, I will come back to this at a certain point, but this is the 10th day of the 7th month, and this is the twentieth day of the ninth month, and this is seventy days, and this is the first day of the fifth month. First day of the fifth month. And there's three days here that are mentioned. Fifth month. Yeah, fifth month. Yeah, thank you. And over here there's three days that are mentioned. So this is a mirror. These three days are something that gives us a clue that there's something in the middle, and what's in the middle is the, is the Day of Atonement. And that's in 457 BC. So since we have this marking to start the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, we then know the 2300 days ends on the 10th day of the 7th month, but we would place this then as the 10th day of the 7th month in 34 AD. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Stephen sees Christ standing on the right hand of God. Christ is now, on the Day of Atonement, standing. He's not sitting. He's not seated upon the right hand of power, but he's standing on the right hand of God. He's closing the probation for the Jews on the Day of Atonement. So when would the 70th week begin? So this is going to be in 27 AD. So what date on the Jewish calendar would we begin this period of seven years? We would do it on the same date. Tenth day of the seventh month. In 27 AD. And this is logical. Now, is this, this is how we th conceive of this, at least on a simple form. Now, how many days would there be from here to here? Okay, well, what date is this? It's the 14th day of the first month. And in our prophetic 360-day, 30-month calendar, which is not a calendar the Jews ever used, this would be how many days? It'd be 42 months plus 4 days. So this would actually be 1,264 days. And this would be 1,256. Does that make sense to people? Who, who, doesn't, who does it not make sense to? Okay, so if this is the 10th day of the month and this is the 14th day of the month, if I'm going to go from count my months, I also have to count the days. And so that means the 10th day of the first month would be 1260 days. So that means, you know, my 1260 would just go to here. 
and then I'd have four days here. So this would be the tenth day of the first month. So you can see it's not, it's not, it is, you know, it, that's how we conceive of it, but when, once we place it on a line, we start to realize there's problems with this model as far as the balance of it, it's not equal. Now, of course, in reality, the Jews never used a 360-day, 30-month calendar. And in, in understanding this, we then would have to, to look at the actual days. Now, I have, in your notes, worked out the biblical calendar for all the dates from 27 AD to 34 AD. Now, if you get the PDF, it's in color, and it's kind of color-coded, so it's maybe a little bit hard to figure out what's here. Um, so this is more for your study later, but uh, it begins on uh, page 55, and it says AD 27, you see these little months, and it's Nisan 1, and that's March 28, 27 AD. And then you'll see the next month, the month names at the bottom in abbreviation EAR. And it's um, then going to be the end of, that's May 25th. And then you look at the next, next month, that's Sivan and May. So it's May 26th and Sivan 1. And you, you just read across this way, the months go across like that. And if you take your time, you probably can figure it out. We're all used to calendars. The numbers on the top are the Jewish or biblical dates for the month, and the numbers on the bottom are the numbers and the dates on our calendar. And for anybody who wants to check the work that I'm doing, this calendar is very, very useful. It's very visual. Um, and I like to even count, you know, on my fingers, and I count the little squares. You know, I don't just use calculators. I count, like, all different kinds of ways. So, if we're going to do this literally, you could look on this and you would see um, that we have a date in 27 AD and it's color coded and you probably can't see it, uh, but there's the start of the 25, 20 days and that's going to be on the 10th day of the 7th month in 27 AD and it's going to be September 30th. So this is September 30th. And that date, according to how the biblical calendar works, is the date in which what the Day of Atonement occurred. And if we go to the end of this calendar, uh, we have, uh, and you can see in this calendar, it's going to say Tammuz, and so it's in 34 AD. You got Nisan, Sivan, Tammuz, Av, El, Tishri. So Tishri is in the bottom left corner on page 61. And you'll see there the 10th day, and it says the 12th, and if you go through and fo follow the color coding, you'll see it's the 12th of October. So this is October 12th. So October 12th is the day that Stephen saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now this calendar differs from the prophetic calendar, the one of 360 days or per year and 30 days per month, in that some months have 29 days because this is based on the moon. And so the moon is only 29.53 days in its cycle from new moon to new moon or from full moon to full moon, however you count it. Though that's an average, it varies a little bit. And then uh, we also know that they add an extra month every second or third year to catch up for the fact that their year is only 354 days long. So it's about 10 days short. So they have to add these extra months every second or third year. In a period of 19 years, they add an average of seven months. So that's 12 years that are common years and seven years that are emboli embolismic, they call it. Now that 12 and 7, you can see here on the 1843 chart, it's a very important. 
So God has designed this cycle of 19 years. Now it's called the Metonic Cycle, named after a Greek mathematician. And so some people say, well, it's pagan, but there's lots of things that are pagan, like forks and spoons and knives and manners and all these kinds of things. So that doesn't make it necessarily bad. But the thing is, it's not the biblical calendar if you are going to use the Metonic Cycle to get dates. So I never use the Metonic Cycle to figure out a date. But I can use it to analyze dates a little bit. I know that usually, whatever date it is in a certain year, the biblical calendar should line up 19 years later. But it doesn't always, because our calendar isn't consistent and, and the Jewish calendar is not exactly 19 years to the cycle, the Metonic cycle. So, those are things that chronologists always have to deal with. But the point is that we know in this period of seven years, we're not going to have 42 months and 42 months. We're going to have a different number of months, and we're going to have a different number of days than 1260. So when you saw this here, we had the 1264 here, and we had the 1256 here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count 1260 days from April 27th when Jesus was crucified and find how close I get to here. And when I did this, I found that I came four days short. That is, from here to here is 1264 days. And that's interesting that when we had the mirror the other, when we had the had 1264 on this side and this three and a half years is when Jesus um, is on earth and this is when he's in heaven so this 1264 days goes here but remember when we just did that simple mirror the 1264 was on this side now it's over here okay so this is 1260 from here to here and then I counted 1260 days this way and I came to the date, um, it's the 26th day, I believe, 26th day of the 8th month, if I remember correctly, and I know it's November 15th. And this falls short, so this is 1260 days, but it falls short, as you can see, by 46 days. So what does this remind you of when you see that 46 days with a 1260? It reminds you of the 2520, doesn't it? And so, in looking at that, something came to my mind, and I thought, well, we had paganism over here with the 1260 in that, in that way that we normally draw it. But the 1260 or the 1264 has come over to this side. So this is going to be paganism. And this is going to re represent papalism. That is, the mirror, when we go to the literal mirror, it creates the prophetic mirror that we know from the 2520 backwards. So that confuses people. So now we're going to have this going this way and this going this way. Okay? And so, if this is paganism and papalism, well this is 538 AD, right? And then this is what date? 1798. And this is what day that's the Day of Atonement? 1844, right? So we can see, this is the Day of Atonement. 1844 lines up with the Day of Atonement. Right? And we can see also that 1798 lines up with November 15th. And that's significant. I just figured it out this morning, so I know now why. Because um, that really bothered me. And we can see papalism is here. This is 538. So we then know that here we have 46 years on this side. 
we're going to have to put 19 years over on this side from this here. So we'd have to put 15 years here. And I don't know if that makes sense to everybody. But this is 1260. And we got 46 on that side. So this is 1260. I need 19 years here. Correct? Mm -hmm. So that means over here is 723. And this is 742. Right? Does that make sense? So we're just looking at it backwards. Now, that means also I'm going to have 677 in here somewhere. I'll just put it in here. So that's the way this mirror is going to look. And, and I do have a diagram of it just at the top of that calendar. A little nice, nicer than what's here and I have a few more dates and numbers and so forth. For one, you can see 677 is the 21st day of the fifth month and it's August 25th in 34 AD. So all these dates end up being in 34 AD. And I probably, I'm kind of running out of room here. Um, but this was quite intriguing when I first laid this out because it, it confirms the 2520 structure of the prophetic mirror. But it's odd that it's going the other direction. And there's things that are going to result from this. And we're going to spend uh, time going through this, trying to understand it in more detail. Now, somebody asked me a question. So I'd, I'd laid this out the first time I had laid it out. I presented it at our Bible study in Alberta. And uh, a lady asked, and she's always the one who asks the questions, right? It's the same person. They asked these questions, and that question should have occurred to me, but it didn't. But she asked it, and then it got me studying. And she said, what other date can you put on there to confirm that this actually works? So, and what she meant is over here, 1844 has the tenth day of the seventh month. So what's the date in 1844 that's significant in this mirror? Well, that's going to be the tenth day of the seventh month, right? Now, I'm not sure, you know, with October, we're going to look at all the dates, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see that. But one of the things that we can see is that there's a date that's a year on the bottom, and then a date that's a day on the top. And so now what we have is we have a day for a year, in a way that we've never thought of it before. A day for a year is always just a period of time. You know, date represents this year, and so we put it out on a line. But now we have days, or years, that are days, and days that are years, and the connection between those dates on the bottom and the dates on the top is extremely significant. So, I thought about it, and I thought, what date could I look at? Now, one of the things I noticed, well, these are days of years, and you know, not every date in these seven years is a significant date. There's lots of dates, but not really a lot of significant dates. There's a few. You know, there's Days of Atonements, and there's Passovers, and so forth, and there's some that are Mark events. And so I thought about it, and I said, well, when I read Daniel 9, verse 26 and 27, when I read it, the only date that comes to mind that's not, you know, not one of these dates is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Right? That's what it's talking about. So I just did a simple thing. I knew that 70 AD to 538 is how many years? So you got 70 AD here. You just subtract 70 from 538. And you get 468. Now this is going to give me a date in 32 AD, right? Because this is 31, you know, I'm going 468 days this way. And it's going to bring me to a date. And I, I wanted to see what date it brought me to. Well, the date it brought me to on the biblical calendar was the 10th day of the 5th month. And where have we seen this before? This is the date that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So that, then I knew that I had something here 
that was going to give us more light. But I, I didn't know what it was. But, so you see what I've done. How many people don't really understand what I did? Okay. I'm going to explain it again. Here we have these years going this way. These are the years of the 2520. 742, 743, counting through till 723, 677. I'm counting this way. I come to 38 AD. I come all the way to 1844. And in this top part, I have the dates that are in that calendar I created starting on September 30th with the 10th day of the 7th month in 27 AD and I'm counting the dates this way. So this date here, 538, lines up with the date on the cross. Right? So this is 27 AD and there's 478 days that I'm counting this way but I'm counting backwards 478 years to 70 AD. So this is the day Jerusalem is destroyed and I look at the date that's in the top numbers and it's the same date you know on the on the Jewish calendar the same date of the year not the same year because it's 32 AD but it's the same date now does everybody understand that okay so this is what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the connection between the dates on the bottom those years and the dates that are produced on the top and so the dates that we're going to be looking at I'm kind of going ahead but we're going to be looking at all these dates 742, 723, 677, uh, 538, 1798, 1844 because we've already looked at this one so that one shows us that there's a connection a day for a year connection between the 2520 laid out underneath the literal 70th week of Christ's life, three of a half of it on earth and three and a half in heaven, where he confirms the covenant with God's people. So it's, it's a very compelling picture because it confirms our message about the 2520 that we can see just on, on the simple level of this that the 2520 is already built into Christ's week not in just the simple way of three and a half and three and a half but in the more complex way in which we put the two 2520s together so I hope, I hope that you can see that now one of the things about this that I like is it's something that you can use for people who are open if you want to share the 2520. Now you don't need to tell them about the 2520 necessarily right away, but you can show them things like this and even though they may not understand the 46 year, you know, days, which are 46 years, um, they will be familiar with this part of it anyway, right? They're going to be familiar with this part. So even though they don't know about the prophetic mirror, they're going to know about this, <laughs> right? So they're going to see that part of it right away if they're a Seventh-day Adventist and they've studied the Bible a little bit and they know about the 2300 days and they know about the 1260 and they believe those things so if they do um, this is going to be something that's going to draw them in that you can do more studies with them so that's one of the things um, that I think is important here <clears throat> now I, I show in my paper and I need to sort of tell you this that I do this in a little more complicated way and that I'm using things called Julian day numbers. Now, some astronomers got together and they figured we need a way to count days, you know, chronologists and so forth. And what they did is they just gave a number, they assigned a number to each date. And that number, other calendars, you can take that number and just use a mathematical formula and derive the date from that number. So it's, it's just a little way that they can keep track of all these different calendars that existed. Um, so historians like it as well. And uh, so I use these Julian day numbers and there's a converter uh, or a calendar converter, Formalabs, and it's in your notes on page 46, about halfway down all those little footnotes. So if anybody wants to use those, there's the 360 day calendar converter and Formalabs 
converter. I like the 360 day one just because it has all the dates, all the calendars right in one spot. You don't have to scroll up and down the page. And also it has the French calendar, which you're going to see is important here uh, tomorrow, why that's important. So it's nice that it has the French calendar there for us as well. The French revolution ca re revolutionary calendar, uh, the one during the French uh, Revolution. I think that's pretty much um, the main thing I wanted to show before lunch. <coughs> but I can bring out a few other things about this, just, just to make this clear of what's actually happening. So, I know the calendars can be confusing, but one of the things that we're going to be, do, going to be doing is we're going to be looking at these dates. So these are the dates on the biblical calendar and we're familiar with them because we use the first day of the first month, the first day of the fifth month, and I'm writing them that way, the tenth day of the seventh month. But we're also going to be looking at these dates on different calendars. So does anybody know what calendar I put this date on? Like what is that calendar called that I called September 30th, 27 AD? Okay, some people say Gregorian. It's actually a Julian calendar. And we're going we're gonna to look at those calendars a little bit. But the Julian calendar, every date before 15, uh, 1572, I believe. you got a lot of numbers in my head. Um, is on the Julian calendar. So, when you go back in time, the calendar starts to drift. The Julian calendar doesn't have... Uh, it has too many leap days, uh, too many February 29ths. Uh, it doesn't take, doesn't remove them, uh, which the Gregorian adjusted for. So in the Gregorian calendar, any date that ends in uh, 100, which you would think is divisible by 4 and would be a leap year, on the Gregorian it's not, but on the Julian it is. So every 128 years on average, uh, the Julian calendar is off but the, by the, from the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar stays in line with the equinoxes, but the Julian calendar drifts over time. Um, but the nice thing about that is that we, have, we can look at dates in the past if we want on the Gregorian calendar. So we can compare sometimes in the past. It will produce interesting results because you'll see that the Gregorian date and the Julian date can both have significance at the same time they're different dates even though it's the same biblical date so you can have three different dates that you can compare so I, I know that you know like I'm used to these things I do calendars all the time I've loved calendars since I was a kid so it's not easy for everybody to think about all these calendars and then the Gregorian calendar is confusing because it was introduced um, in different places at different times. Now anybody who saw Tess's presentation on the Russian Revolution, what, what's the Russian Revolution called? The October Revolution. When did it happen? In November, right? <laughs> That's because the Russians were using the Julian calendar still. They hadn't changed to the Gregorian and, because it was Pope Gregory that made the Gregorian calendar and they're Russian Orthodox, right? Why should they adopt a Catholic Pope's calendar, right? So, um, after the revolution, they changed to the Gregorian calendar soon after. Uh, but we look at the date, November 9th, uh, when the, the decree of the press happened that Lenin did, and it's on November 9th, she says. But it's October, I think October 27th. Um, so, so, you know, there's these, these calendars, but they're very, very useful, and God has ordained all of these calendars. Now, some people may, what, what's he talking about? There's the biblical calendar, all these pagan calendars. God has ordained them for a purpose. Now, we know that because when Jesus was crucified in 31 AD, that number 31 becomes a symbol. 70 AD, 
with the destruction of Jerusalem, wherever I put it. Yeah, over there. Is that a symbol? It's on a, a Gregorian or a Julian calendar, that date. But yet, God has ordained it for prophecy. And so we can use these various calendars to tell us stuff because they're symbols. And when we line these symbols up, even with different calendars, they're significant. Uh, there's another one that Tess used, and it was the French Republican calendar, since I'm talking about calendars. And on July 27th, 1794, there was an event. It was a coup. It's called the coup of the 9th of Thermidor, right? Well, that's because the 9th of Thermidor is on the French Republican calendar. Now, Thermidor is the 11th month, and it's the 9th day of the 11th month. But it's, it's on the French calendar. It's also significantly July 27th on the Gregorian calendar. Now, July 27th, what is that? Okay, that's the date that Josiah Litch used from 1299 A.D., July 27th, that starts the first woe, right? And so we're going to see that all of these things are very, very significant. These dates are significant. And I was going to address this later, but I have time, so I might as well address it now. When I'm doing this, you know, some people might think it's just you know, a magician's trick. You know, you got all these numbers and you just throw them into a hat and you pull them out and, you know, you're just, you're just fooling us somehow with these numbers. But one is you can go to the Bible, you can go to history, you can go to these calendar converters, you can look at it. Now, I've tried to weigh out some of the statistical probabilities of these things. Me and Philip talked about it because he's a mathematician. And, um, it is interesting that, and the way that I picture it is like throwing darts at a calendar. So for instance, when, when I, we did the study on Ezekiel, Ezekiel had four dates, or, or pardon me, 13 dates in the book of Ezekiel, and we had at that time four dates on our line. We had the first day of the first month, the first day of the fifth month, uh, the, the fifth day of the fourth month, and the tenth day of the seventh month. Those were our way marks. We all had them all being represented as biblical dates. And all of those four dates are in the book of Ezekiel. So in order to, to look at the statistics of that, you would just say, well, what if I have a calendar with 13, uh, with those four dates on it, and I have 13 darts, and I'm going to throw those 13 darts what are the chances that I'm going to hit four of those dates? You know, if I'm blindfolded and I'm, you know, far away from it or whatever. You know, just the random statistical probability. And, and you get something that has, I believe it was five, like, you know, it was one point or 2.4 times 10 to the power of five or something like that, or 10 to the power of six. It's, it's, a, it's really large, uh, I can't remember, large or small odds. It's, it's very unlikely that you're going to hit those four dates with your 13 darts. And also two of those dates in Ezekiel, the first one and the last one, are the same date on the calendar in 1844. So that's the one, the first one is the fifth day of the fourth month when Ezekiel starts his prophecy. And that's July 21st, 592 BC. And the last date in Ezekiel, that's in chapter 40, is the 10th day of the 7th month, and it's October 22nd. So we've already done this. We're basically going to be doing this, but using this. We're comparing biblical dates with dates on calendars. And the chances of that occurring randomly would be, I think it was 4.2 times 10 to the power of 8. So it was, again, this really extremely unlikely. I don't know if all of you understand powers, but that's like every time you have a power that's an extra zero you add on it. So you're in the billions, tens of billions of chances against a one. You know, you would never bet on those odds. So, so this is what we're going to be doing. And what I'm going to do after lunch is I'm going to be looking at this bottom line in a little bit more detail. 
not comparing it so much with the dates above, but looking at what this structure means to us now. One of the things that Parminder has been teaching us, and that to me is the most significant thing that I've, I've learned from Parminder, um, is that as we walk pass over the ground, there is light, as we, these events are being fulfilled, there is light that is reflected upon the past and shines into the future. So it shows us where we're going. But it first goes to the past. And the epitome of this is the cross. So on the cross, the disciples did not understand what Jesus was saying to them, but afterwards they did. And the light that came from the cross shone back on all the types and ceremonies in the past, and it helped shine light into the future upon the prophecies that were tied to those types. The 70 weeks, the 2300 days, all these prophecies were tied to things in the past. And the thing is, it's as we pass over the ground. We would like to know things that we need to know before we need to know them, but God shows us things we need to know when we need to know them. And that's what God's been doing in this movement. But God is also sh shining light that we have not been willing to look at all the time about what's coming. Not just about what, but when. And this is what we're going to see as we go through this study. So, I hope that was easy enough to understand. I'm trying to get things simplified. But let us now close in prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, we are so thankful for the light that comes from the cross of Christ in all the ways that it does. We are thankful, Lord, for salvation that's been offered to us. And we are thankful for the types and symbols. As Ellen White says, that's what we need to understand about the cross, about Christ. We need to see Him in types and symbols. It is how we come to know Him. How we come to trust in Him. Lord, we, we ask that You can be with each person here as we contemplate these things, as we pass over the ground and see how the events that are being fulfilled shine upon the past reflect upon the past and shine light into the future upon our path. We need to see what's coming ahead, Lord. We need to be prepared for it and we need to warn others of those events. We know that we've been negligent in our duty, that we haven't understood everything that we should. But we just ask, Lord, that you can forgive us and help us to apply ourselves in understanding your truth. We know, Lord, that you are doing an amazing work, that you have been working in our lives in such a way. Each person here knows it. We just ask, Lord, that we can cooperate with you in this work, that we will not hinder the work that you want to do. Help us to be faithful. Help us to have open hearts and minds. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.